Hello and welcome to the sixth installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to show off some mapping tips, time efficiency tool tips, and to address some mistakes I've made throughout the past six tutorials, plus my introduction video. This video will be broken down into the following segments. What are your tips for making my maps look more professional? What are your tips for more efficient usage of my time? And what mistakes have you made that I should be aware of? There will not be an application demonstration after the bulk of this tutorial. This video is meant to serve as a wrap-up video to the past six tutorials, all dealing with mapping and tiles. The first tip I'm going to discuss is that modularity in mapping is generally bad. By modularity, I mean basically exactly what the original game is trying to pass off as good mapping. It's clear that some of Game Freak's maps are built in a perfectly aligned fashion. To be fair, there are more maps that aren't structured this way, but you can't say that it's hard to find maps that are structured like this. All of the chunks of trees seem to be perfectly aligned with each other, creating large masses of, well, squares. We don't want this. Take after real life if you need any justification. Just look at how trees naturally grow. If you can point out even two trees that are perfectly aligned anywhere in nature that weren't intentionally planted that way, take a picture and send it to me. I'll give you a free internet high five for your humble achievement. We can see this in other tiles as well, such as with patches of grass and bodies of water. Again, if you're ever able to find a lake that is perfectly rectangular in nature, send a picture to me. I'll make sure to give you like three free internet high fives for that. Now let's look at some more natural looking maps. You can tell that the creator of these maps took a lot of time to misalign the tiles and make sure that every single area of his maps were as professional as possible. I suggest you take notes here. The creator of this map must be a really great guy. Just look at how amazing he handles the spontaneity of his tiles. I'm the creator of these maps. Moving on to my second mapping tip, one by one pathways are a big no-no. Do not do this. They're a huge pain in the ass for the player to navigate through. Especially when the tiles are designed such that it's extremely hard to see what's going on when the player is walking around. And especially, especially when the creator of the map uses these one-by-one -one pathways in forested areas with a crap ton of other, somehow, passable tiles. It's just really tough to intuitively know where to go when the player is trying to get through the map. Now let's look at some better designed areas. You can tell that when the player is in a tight position, the mapper took very careful consideration not to trap his audience in a one-by-one -one pathway. Just look at this mountain ledge. Any other mapper would almost definitely decide on a slim one-by-one -one pathway along the edge of this mountain, but not this mapper. The player is given at least two spaces of freedom at every single point on the path, giving the player a deserving sense of relief. If you can't quite tell if your paths are more than one-by-one, -one, then you should load Grid View under Advanced Maps Settings Menu Item. My next tip deals with wild Pokémon. When I talked about the Wild Pokemon tab in my first tutorial, I never said anything about the specific encounter ratios for each distinct Pokemon slot. You know how some Pokemon are harder to find than others in the wild? Like how Pikachu is obtainable in Viridian Forest, but it's much more difficult to come across than, for example, a Metapod. I'm going to discuss the specifics here. Under the Grass tab, there are 12 Pokemon slots. The first two slots appear 20% of the time each. Slots 3 through 6 appear 10% of the time each. Slots 7 and 8 appear 5% of the time each. Slots 9 and 10 appear 4% of the time each. And finally, slots 11 and 12 appear 1% of the time each. Adding all of these percentages up gets us 100%. Under the Water tab, there are 5 Pokémon slots. The first slot appears 60% of the time. The second slot appears 30% of the time. The third slot appears 5% of the time, the fourth slot appears 4% of the time, and finally the fifth slot appears 1% of the time. The tree tab is used for things like rock smash encounters which you'll find in the Hoenn games. Under the tree tab there are 5 Pokemon slots and their encounter rates are the exact same as under the water tab. Under the fishing rod tab there are 10 Pokemon slots. The first two slots are reserved for the old rod. Slot 1 appears 70% of the time, and slot 2 appears 30% of the time. Slots 3 through 5 are reserved for the good rod. Slot 3 appears 60% of the time, slots 4 and 5 appear 20% of the time each, and slots 6 through 10 are reserved for the super rod. Slot 6 appears 40% of the time, 
Slot 7 appears 30% of the time. Slot 8 appears 15% of the time. Slot 9 appears 10% of the time. And finally, slot 10 appears 5% of the time. Using this information, you have almost total control over every single wild encounter in your maps. My final tip is do not allocate large areas in your maps to absolute nothingness. The original games and even plenty of hacks do this over and over again and it looks horrendous. Why make your map bigger than it needs to be if you're not going to decorate it? I know mapping can be boring sometimes, but it's probably a bad idea to sacrifice the quality of your game because you got too lazy to spice up your maps. It's time to move on to my tool tips. These will help boost your time efficiency when working with graphics. My first tip is for shortening the amount of time you spend recoloring custom tiles to match your palette. I'm going to assume you're using paint for this. Let's say we're recoloring a custom tree. Instead of editing each pixel individually, we can do something more efficient. Click the eyedropper tool, then right click on the old tree's color you want to use on the new tree. Then left click on the new tree's color that you want to replace. Finally, select the eraser tool and hold down the right click and drag the eraser all over the tree. This will efficiently replace the old color with the new color and it will not mess with any of the other colors so you don't have to worry about generating any errors. I'm always surprised to hear that people say they've never known about this trick. It's extremely useful and I'm not sure I would have the patience to recolor my tiles if it didn't exist. My next tool tip deals with replacing tiles on any map in advanced map. Let's say we're creating a landmass with a shoreline and a very large body of water next to it. After creating the landmass, we have to edit every single one of those template tiles with water tiles. It's going to take a while, unless you know about this trick. If you have a mass of the same tile and you want to change all of these tiles to a different one, click on your desired tile in the block section. Then, instead of painting over all of these template tiles, simply click the middle button on your mouse. All of the tiles have been replaced with just a single button click. This function also works in the Movement Permissions tab. Simply click on the desired movement permission, then middle click on the chunk of tiles you wish to change. My final tool tip stems from a function in Animation Editor. I said in a past tutorial that instead of editing tiles in Animation Editor itself, I like to edit them externally. I'm going to quickly run through how to edit tiles in Animation Editor so you know how it's done. First, load the animation you want to edit. In the Tile Editing section, click on the Edit Tile checkbox. From here, you can click on whatever palette color you want to use and then paint over the tile by clicking anywhere on the little 8x8 tile window. Once you're done editing, click the Save Tile button. If you decide you'd rather revert back to how the tile looked before you began editing it, click on the Reload Tile button. Remember to click the Save Animations button when you're done. It's time to go over any errors I've made in past videos. Cue the playback. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the second installment of this series. Ignore the zero out box. But I've done some digging around and found that we are indeed given 13 new palettes to work with here. I'll make sure to discuss this more if I get a hold of any more information. That value is 20, the only one having a proper description in the options list. There are some other nuances when it comes to bridges, but those are mostly related to getting your custom bridge graphics to work and since we haven't gotten to inserting custom graphics, we'll leave it alone for now. Sometimes you'll come across blocks that use these behaviors, so you know when to use them on any custom tiles you want to insert. An example of this is the bridge tile, which we'll get to in a future tutorial. There is something in each of those clips that is either incorrect or deserving of more elaboration. Let's start with the Thank you so much for being my audience. I didn't even realize how condescending that outro was until just now when I look back on my videos. I'm genuinely sorry for that. When I express my thanks, I really mean it. Moving on to And I'll be back in the second installment of this series. That ringtone playing in the background? Yeah, it wasn't yours. When I was editing that video, I kept hearing my ringtone play at the end of it. I kept checking my phone every single time and just figured whoever was calling kept hanging up so quickly that my phone didn't register them as missed calls. I kid you not, at the exact moment that video was being uploaded to YouTube, it occurred to me that maybe, just maybe, that phone call was captured as part of the video's audio and that's why it kept repeating itself. I apologize for that one, but I also don't since it's hilarious to think that almost every single person who watches that video will end up checking their phones at the exact same moment. Now we can cover something somewhat informational, that being, ignore the zero out box. 
And by informational, I mean nowhere near informational. I've looked through every single map that exists in both Fire Red and Emerald and cannot find a single map that uses the zero out box. I've also tried manipulating its value, but I can't get anything to change. There's no info on this anywhere on the internet other than a couple people posting incorrect information about it, or just simply speculating what it could be. I guess it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Next is something I've learned more about, but I've done some digging around and found that we are indeed given 13 new palettes to work with here. I'll make sure to discuss this more if I get a hold of any more information. I've done some research and discovered something for myself. As you know, there are 13 palettes in the block editor that we can use. What I didn't know was that the palettes 0 through 5 are dedicated to whatever tileset is loaded into the first tileset slot in the header tab, while palettes 6 through 12 are dedicated to whatever tileset is loaded into the second tileset slot in the header tab. Not only that, but from jumping around to different maps, it looks like each and every tileset comes with its own personal set of palettes. This means that when you edit a tileset's palettes, you're actually only editing the palettes that are specific to that particular tileset. Every other tileset is completely separate from the palettes you're editing. This is interesting as it gives us an unfathomable amount of palettes to work with. This will allow for some pretty serious map diversity. I need to clarify this. That value is 20, the only one having a proper description in the options list. In that clip, I said that the value of the background byte for a block is covered by hero is 10, even though the box had a value of 20 in it. This is a case of me saying something and then displaying it incorrectly on the screen. To clarify, in fire red, the block is covered by hero byte value is 20. In emerald, this value is 10. The next error deals with me saying I'll show off something and then forgetting to show it off. There are some other nuances when it comes to bridges, but those are mostly related to getting your custom bridge graphics to work, and since we haven't gotten to inserting custom graphics, we'll leave it alone for now. Sometimes you'll come across blocks that use these behaviors so you know when to use them on any custom tiles you want to insert. An example of this is the bridge tile, which we'll get to in a future tutorial. When inserting bridge tiles, you need to be aware that there are certain behavior bytes that must be assigned to them in order for the whole cross above and below process to work properly. Bridge tiles which float above solid ground must have a behavior byte of 08. Bridge tiles which float above water must have a behavior byte of 70, denoted as teleport warp for whatever reason. We're finished with discussing my mistakes, however I do want to warn about something I should have warned you about a long time ago. When you're making various changes to your ROM, you should be creating backups of your ROM before making those changes. There's always potential for something to go wrong and ruin your entire game, even if it doesn't seem so. To make a backup, simply copy and paste your ROM somewhere where you won't touch it. If the ROM you're editing suddenly breaks, you can easily just replace it with the backup and then try again. This is one of the most important things to remember when ROM hacking. The final issue I want to discuss is my voice to music volume ratio. In case you haven't noticed, I like to put some subtle music in the background of my tutorials to liven things up a bit. However, sometimes I feel like the ratio is off. I don't want to make the music volume too low or too high as it gets in the way of my explanations. But sometimes it's tough to judge these after I've been sitting at a computer listening to myself speak for hours on end. If you ever feel that the music is becoming an obstacle, please let me know and I'll try to remember to tone it down a bit in my future tutorials. That's everything I wanted to cover in this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video's comment section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the seventh installment of this series.